Great turnout. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of uh, the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. Um, and we're, uh, we couldn't be more excited to, um, uh, to be hosting Frank Four this afternoon, who, of course, is here to talk about his new book, The Last Politician, Inside Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a particular treat to be uh, uh, I introducing Frank, you know, apart from being a, a very devoted and, and longtime patron of PNP, his, his whole, whole family is really, uh, and, he, and he's, a, he's a particularly great guy. Um, you know, Frank, who, who writes for The Atlantic, is, is, is really an exceptional journalist. Uh, he's, uh, he's someone who's always worth reading because of his insightful and often uh, fresh takes on um, quite, quite an array of topics. Uh, and his several uh, previous books um, reflect the, the range of, its, uh, of, of his interests, uh, whether it's soccer, uh, which of course was the subject of his first book 19 years ago, or Jewish athletes, or big tech, uh, the, the subjects of his, uh, of his subsequent works. Um, his new book uh, is a behind-the-scenes account of the, uh, the first two years of the Biden presidency. Um, such accounts, you know, have been pretty rare um, under Joe Biden, uh, whose team simply hasn't been inclined to divulge uh, much about their, their inner workings. You know, by this time, during the, uh, the Trump administration, there, there have been, I mean, how many books, you know? <laughs> Revealing um, all the clashes and chaos uh, inside inside that uh, crazy administration, but the Biden group has been uh, much more tight-lipped and difficult to see into. Uh, but Frank's book um, is really significant because it offers uh, um, fresh and revealing details about how Biden and his senior staff um, overcame some uh, some huge challenges and uh, a faltering start. To, um, to make impressive gains in both uh, domestic and, and foreign policy. Um, as I'm sure Frank will uh, elaborate on in, in a minute, uh, he began research for the book with a more critical view of Biden than he uh, ended up with. And he argues in the book that, you know, by passing several monumental pieces of legislation at home and, and rallying the world um, uh, to Ukraine's defense abroad, Biden has shown himself to be um, both a more ambitious and capable president than uh, w widely anticipated and, and arguably e even still appreciated. Um, and, um, and, and Biden's provided a, a proof, uh, Frank argues, and I think persuasively, that political deal-making and coalition building, you know, the essential work of politicians, uh, can still produce results. Uh, in conversation with Frank this afternoon will be uh, David Lenehart, a Pulitzer Prize winning senior writer for the New York Times, where he's worked for uh, just a mere 24 years. Um, David produces the Times uh, daily newsletter in the morning uh, and also writes for Sunday Review. And, and he has a new book coming out next month uh, uh, titled Ours Was the Shining Future about the modern uh, American economy and the decline uh, of the American dream. And he'll be speaking about that book uh, here on uh, October 30. So please join me in welcoming uh, Frank and David. Hello, everybody. Oh, what a turnout. Uh, it's like a home game for you, Frank. Um, uh, I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about the book. Uh, well, I'm really excited to be talking to Frank about it here. Um, so we are going to try to make this conversation uh, a little bit like a conversation, dozens of conversations that Frank and I have had over the last year. Um, we were acquaintances. Frank actually edited me uh, um, a chapter of a book called Jewish Jocks, um, which I'm sure you can order uh, at the desk. Yeah. Um, and uh, But we didn't know each other well. And then it turned out that Frank and I wrote large portions of our books at the same coffee shop, Compass Coffee. 
uh, over on Mass App. And so just about every day for months, we would spend 20 minutes taking a coffee break as a break from writing and talking through different writing issues we were having um, and soccer issues and basketball issues and all kinds of things. So we want to try to give you a little flavor of those many conversations that we had here today. So Frank, thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing this with me. It's a pleasure. So let's start with what to me is kind of the obvious question. How did you end up writing this book? Meaning your background is not, it's not a Bob Woodward type background where you're constantly covering White Houses and, and looking for scoops. You, you've been more of, of an intellectual journalist, if you don't mind my calling you that. Uh, and, then, and then you decided to go write this book and not only did you decide to go write it, but you have these amazing behind the scenes stories of what it's like in the White House. The book just became a bestseller, if you haven't seen. So how is it that you be happened to write this book? Um, well, I think it started in this store. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I my Friday nights were, <laughs> were actually spent in politics and prose with my, uh, my other nerdy friends. And my parents, uh, this is a little bit lore that's been exaggerated over time within my family, but their, um, they gave us credit cards that were just for emergencies, but there was one exemption, which is that if you wanted to buy a book at Politics and Prose, you could put it on the family card. And it's, um, and so I ended up just accumulating a library of American history and American politics here, and I knew um, Carla and Barbara, the original owners of the store, and every time I would walk in here, they were uh, generous enough to have conversations with me about what was coming out and what they were interested in. And uh, you know, I think Brad and Lissa have beautifully carried that tradition on into the future. So the book actually began with my editor, Ann Godoff, calling me and saying, you know, I think you should write a book about the first 100 days of the Biden presidency. And this was in maybe September of 2020. And, and it didn't actually occur to me like this was a very good idea for many of the reasons that you just articulated, that I'd never done um, one of these access-driven inside books before. And also, I didn't especially, as Brad noted, I didn't especially care for Joe Biden. He was never uh, a politician who elevated my pulse. Um, and in fact, I can recall the first time that I had a conversation with Joe Biden when I was 24 years old, and I was a reporter, and I got him on the phone, and five minutes into the conversation, I was like, get this guy off. <laughs> His stories never stop. Um, um, it's like, I'm not a veteran reporter, but I've heard all of these stories before. Um, and so she suggested the idea, and it's, I sat with it for a little bit, and I thought, all right, well, this is actually interesting to me because it's a story about government. It's a story about how the administration would come rushing into a pandemic, an economic collapse, and that there were all of these broken institutions uh, that, it, that the Trump administration had destroyed and would need to be resurrected in some sort of way or maybe reinvented. And so that was interesting to me. And so I said, you know what, I, I, I like the challenge of um, pushing myself as a journalist to try to do this project that I'd that was very foreign to me. And so I started doing it. And it was, um, it was pretty hard at first because um, before I started, I'd called around to various people who I was sure were going to play significant roles in the Biden administration. And I tried to get their pulse, take their pulse to see if they would be willing to play ball with me as I went on. And uh, they agreed, but it was very easy to agree at that early stage. That, and, and during the first couple months, I felt like I was making very, very little progress. Because of course, when people are rushing into an administration, they're trying to get their legs. They're very afraid of being the one leaker in the organization. And then the story is unfolding before them. They can't narrate history because they're not even sure what the history is that they'll be narrating. And so we got to the 100 day mark and then Biden proposed these two big pieces of legislation, the what became the infrastructure bill and then the Build Back Better piece of legislation, which was a sweeping expansion of the social safety net and the most ex expansive uh, climate change bill that had ever been produced. And I thought, all right, that's my story. Then we got to the end of the first year, and Joe Manchin seemed to pull the plug on Build Back Better. And I had to make a judgment at that moment, because 
really the most significant decision you can make as a book writer is where you end the book. And if I had ended the book there, it would have been, it would have colored the story in a very distinct sort of way. It would have been a story about a Jimmy Carter-like presidency. And if I had made that judgment, it wouldn't have withstood the next year's worth of events. And so my, my editor, who was very wise, said, spend another year working on this book. Go through the end of the midterms. I think that that is your terminus. And I wish we'd figured that, that out in advance so that I could have planned my book leave accordingly. And I could have made various other judgments about my life that would have accorded with that. But, um, but, but it's that, a better book. Yeah, because. thank you. Um, before we're gonna we're gonna cover Afghanistan, we're gonna cover economic policy, and then we're gonna look a little bit to the future, uh, the 2024 campaign. I promise we will talk about Joe Biden's age, but it's not gonna be the only subject we talk about. Um, uh, and then we'll open it up to all of you to to ask about things other than than those topics or to go deeper. Before we do that, I just want to ask one thing. So you said you started as a Biden skeptic. Yes. Um, his weaknesses are fairly well known. What did you come to believe? were his core strengths. So the thing about Joe Biden is uh, that he's, he's messy in a very human sort of way. Um, I think you know, he, he exaggerates stories. He, um, uh, he, he'll, he's famous for gaffing. And what I hadn't realized were all of the ways in which he is so supremely human actually translated into his core political skills. So he wears his insecurities and ambitions on his sleeve. And for, for whatever reason, he's able to actually um, uh, kind of dial back his ego. And when he's negotiating with somebody or about to talk to a foreign leader, about to talk to Kevin McCarthy, uh, he's able to look at them as like-minded people. And he's able to say, okay, I understand where you're coming from politically. I can diagnose your self-interest. I can diagnose all the baggage that you're gonna to bring to this conversation. And then I can strategize based on that accordingly. And to me, that's kind of the core of politics is being able to think that sort of way about constituencies, about, uh, about, about your fellow politicians, about the country. So. So let's talk about Afghanistan, which comes right off that. I mean, I think in many ways, the, uh, the most dramatic scenes in the book are about Afghanistan. Um, s some of the, the, the biggest piece of new information about it. Um, uh, and I would encourage you all to make sure you read the book and those parts. W we wanna talk about kind of a little bit of a strategic frame here. So the Afghanistan war was a disaster, right? I mean, it, it, it was going on for 20 years. I mean, that is just an unbelievable length of a war. We were in this cycle in which members of the military and policy experts aligned with both parties would promise just a little longer, yeah. and we're going to fix this. Yeah. It's, gonna, it's, it's all going to work out great. And it just again and again and again, they were wrong. And, and there was no sign they were about to be right this time. And so I would argue that on, on a base level, Joe Biden's courage to say, enough. You've been telling us this again and again and again. You've been wrong. Americans are dying. We're bombing Afghans. Enough. It's time to get out. I would argue that at root that was a courageous decision and it was the right decision. I wouldn't argue that they executed it well. And so I guess I would ask you, do you share my basic sense that they got the overall decision right? And, and how could they have avoided such a mess with such a human toll in executing it? Or was there no way? Um, I'm going to wind my way to the answer by just talking Great. about Joe Biden as a character a little bit and how he arrived at the place that he arrived. Because one of the things that fascinates me about him is that he's got this very conflicted relationship to the American elite. On the one hand, he desperately wants their approval. Um, on the other hand, he knows that they roll their eyes at him. And so... Uh, as a result, he looks he looks at something like the Munich Security Council or Davos or any of or the Council on Foreign Relations, and his attitude is, well, these guys are lazy and hidebound, and I'm going to show that I'm smarter than they are, and um, so that that's part of his thinking. The other thing is is that he's got uh, this very strong 
uh, moral code that's very specific as it relates to gratitude. And so he would go to Afghanistan as a senator and he would visit uh, he'd visit the warlords who'd taken over the government. He'd meet with um, Hamid Karzai, who was the, the head of the state. And he would walk away thinking, or, he was pissed off. He was like, we have made all of these sacrifices on behalf of Afghanistan, and where's the gratitude? I'm just getting hectored constantly about how the United States could do more. And that's not great logic, from, <laughs> but it what it did was I think it freed him to think unsentimentally about the question of Afghanistan. And because of all the baggage that he brought to the table, he was able to see before the rest of the American foreign policy establishment that it was the fruitless war that you were describing, that we weren't equipped to do the nation building that we were committed to doing there. And so very early on, when you get to the Obama administration, he's kind of a dissident within the Obama administration, constantly raising the uncomfortable questions about getting out. Um, so we get to this moment. So he, he the way- and, and can I just stop you there? And he, and he thinks that Obama gets rolled, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he tells Obama at one point, the, the generals know that you're a rookie and they're gonna try to jam you, don't let them jam you. Interestingly, Mark Milley has much the same opinion that, uh, that Joe Biden has about what happened during the Obama administration, that Milley was a guy who was sitting in the basement of the Pentagon working with the generals on the other side of the street. And he was saying that the generals were trying to jam Obama. They were presenting him with options that made things very uncomfortable for him. They were leaking things to the press. And so when Biden comes to office, he tries to configure a policy process for working through the question about leaving in a way that wouldn't let the generals jam him. And so, but I would say, which is very savvy bureaucratic operating. On the other hand, I think that the omission was that he was so, in his worldview, it was a very binary question, staying, leaving. And he thought a lot about it through the lens of Bo Biden, who was his son, who had been in the military, and all of his sympathies flowed in the direction of the rank and file American soldier who was going to get set on one more fruitless mission where they might get killed. And he didn't think very much about the humanitarian consequences of leaving. And I would say this is, this is something that probably starts at the top, where if you don't prioritize thinking about um, humanitarian evacuations, those evacuations are never going to get the resources, the intellectual capital, in order to pull them off. And so that's one thing that I would diagnose as a reason why, uh, why we failed. The other thing is uh, Joe Biden's explanation, which I think does hold up, which is that the intelligence agencies just missed how quickly uh, Af the Afghan government would crumble. He, the CIA didn't tell him that it was going to crumble that much. Now, that's not a totally absolving answer because the government was going to crumble in two months or three months or four months or 18 months. It doesn't matter. At some point, there was going to be a Taliban takeover of the country and a humanitarian consequence that ensued. It just wasn't going to be on America's watch. I, I mean, to me, there's, there's a fascinating broader lesson as I was reading your Afghanistan sections. Just in, it applies to so many realms of life. Um, not as important as the military and of country's future, but some of them quite important, which is don't plan only for the scenario that you think is the most likely. Because you might be wrong. <laughs> um, or the scenario that has a 20% chance of happening might happen. 20% happens a lot. And and I, I don't know that they could have, I don't think they sort of could have started pulling out lots of people immediately because that was effectively yeah. giving up on yeah. the possibility of a government. Yeah. But they certainly could have been ready for things to be much worse than than they expected. Yeah, well, one of the stories that I got in the course of doing this reporting was I would hear about Hillary Clinton's own efforts I in Afghanistan. And it's just an interesting counterpoint to the Biden way of thinking and doing things that um, Hillary had this relationship with the women of Afghanistan that went all the way back to the Clinton administration where she had gone to war with the State Department over recognizing uh, the Taliban. And when she was for, uh, Secretary of State, she'd given awards to various uh, Afghan women and 
it was very personal for her, this connection. And so as soon as Biden makes his announcement that he's withdrawing from Afghanistan, Clinton becomes a repository for all sorts of other people in the NGO world or journalistic world who are worrying about what will happen to specific Afghan, specific Afghan women. And she starts to go to the Biden administration and to say, look, um, specifically, she had a list of 125 women who would be likely killed by the Afghanistan that had been sent to her by someone within the U.S. government. And she would go to Tony uh, Blinken, the Secretary of State, and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, and, and she called it the kill list. Here's the kill list. You guys have to take this seriously. You have to begin pre preparing for this. And she would ask questions that applied bureaucratic pressure on them. She would, what's your process for getting these women out? What's your process for doing these evacuations? And she didn't get good answers from them, and they were quite dismissive. And in the end, um, as she saw that the Biden administration wouldn't be doing this. She orchestrated her own mass evacuation effort where she acquired safe, ha her NGOs acquired safe houses in Kabul. They worked with military contractors to get women to the airport in advance of uh, the Ghani government collapsing. And so to me, it is, you know, you're, what you're saying is absolutely true that bureaucratically, when you're pushing for an objective, and you know that objective is the right objective, and you know that there are all these bureaucratic impediments, you just have to keep pushing forward, that I think correlates with the inability to accurately assess risk. But I do think that the Clinton thing suggested, her efforts suggested that it was possible to push harder on the policy process to begin to develop these contingencies because even if you didn't see them from within, there were people from without pointing them out. And before we leave Afghanistan, can you just spend a minute contrasting it with Ukraine? I mean, Ukraine really does seem to be a success, um, more so than Afghanistan so far. Obviously, there's a long way to go. What do you think explains the fundamental reason that Biden was dovish on Afghanistan and is hawkish on Ukraine? Um, well, Biden actually had a lot of clarity in his own head about the trajectory of American foreign policy, that for him, Afghanistan was rooted in the last chapter of American foreign policy. It was rooted in the war on terror, and it was time to redirect our attention to the next set of challenges, the primary one of which is China. But he had this frame in his head from the start about how global democracy was at war with global autocracy. And we had very crystalline vision into Russia's war planning as early as October uh, uh, 2021. So many months before the, so it, unlike Afghanistan, where we couldn't really see what was happening, and there were various uh, reasons that we could explain why our intelligence was imperfect about Afghanistan, despite being there for so many damn years. Um, with Russia, we could see what, it, we could see it coming. It was clear how to take response. And that story is really about how, um, Initially, we had two fears. One was that the Ukrainians weren't taking the problem seriously enough because there were a series of really uh, intense conversations that Biden, Kamala Harris, Tony Blinken, other members of the administration had with, uh, with the Ukrainian counterparts where they said, look, here's the intelligence. You're about to be invaded. And the Ukrainians couldn't take it seriously because I think maybe their ability to ris assess risk was off in much the same way that you described, because it's such an incredible thing to consider that this neighbor is going to come in and try to unseat your government and take over your whole country. Very, very hard to wrap your mind around that. So that was one initial struggle. And then the other thing that I think Biden did um, effectively, well, the two other things. One was the world had been pretty indifferent to the problem of autocracy for the last couple of years, not just in, in Europe, but in the United States. Um, and so being able to bring everybody together to essentially be committed to working in sync and knowing how to work in sync, which meant pushing on certain sanctions initially, maybe uh, setting other goals aside to be achieved at a later date. And then there was the problem of Russian escalation. Biden is a guy who comes from the silent generation. He grew up hiding under his desk during um, during drills. And so uh, he's really afraid of nuclear war. 
And uh, I, I would ask Biden aides, uh, when you go into a meeting with Biden about Ukraine, what's the question that he always asks? And the answer is, if I give the Ukrainians this weapon system, what's the chances that it'll cause the Russians to dangerously escalate? Now, as somebody who tends to be a Ukraine hawk, I don't, I wish sometimes he would go faster on Ukraine, but as uh, a citizen of the world who would like to avoid nuclear war, I'm kind of grateful that he keeps posing that question. Yeah, and it's an example of what we were just saying, which is even if the odds are low, you want to know how low. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Frank has this lovely sketch in the book of Jake Sullivan, who now is a, a foreign policy, is the national security advisor, but was a close advisor to Biden on domestic policy. Um, uh, as much of his background, is that fair to say, is in domestic policy, as foreign policy. And you sort of use Jake as an avatar for a certain kind of establishment Democrat um, uh, who over time came to doubt some of the uh, post-Reagan centrism of the Democratic Party, who looked and said, wait a second, for whatever accomplishments Bill Clinton and Barack Obama had, if you look at any chart about inequality, they didn't stop the long-term rise of inequality. It just kept going. If you look at the promises that people made, both Democrats and Republicans, made about what global trade would do, they didn't really work out very well. China didn't become free, and we didn't become rich. Um, and those were basically the promises. And you, you set Jake up as this figure who basically began to question, wait a second, maybe the left was more right about some things than the center left. Um, uh, I, I think both Frank and I have asked questions about that ourselves over the course of our careers. Um, so I think that's one reason it particularly resonated with me and probably with you. Can you talk a little bit about w what you, why you think parts of the establishment left, particularly younger parts, people maybe in their 40s than their 60s, have come to question centrism and whether you think it's an enduring shift in the Democratic Party. Uh, yeah, I was chuckling at the element of autobiography and the way that you were describing that. <laughs> and, like, and based on our own conversations that we've had about this over time. So Jake Sullivan was somebody who, um, who grew up as um, kind of touted as a, as a wonderkind, who uh, Richard Holbrook described as a future Secretary of State. He worked for uh, Hillary Clinton in the State Department, where I think she uh, thought of him in, in, in similar sort of wonderkind-ish terms. And um, after, so when Hillary Clinton runs for president in 2016, she asked Jake Sullivan, who'd been working on foreign policy, who'd actually, just before that, I think had been Joe Biden's national security advisor when Joe Biden was vice president, to look at domestic policy. And what she said was, I see Elizabeth Warren as one of my I think most dangerous competitors, I don't think she saw Bernie Sanders as a dangerous competitor at that early stage, but there was all this anger out there in the world. And she wanted, she asked Jake and some other people to help formulate a response to that. And Sullivan hadn't paid very much attention to Occupy Wall Street or to the financial crisis or uh, the reasons why Thomas Piketty's book became a New York Times bestseller. And he started to examine all this and he started to begin uh, kind of a slow transformation. What's so interesting about this is that it's happening simultaneously to a bunch of other people who were his cohort, who would then go on to populate the Biden administration, who were coming from the same position. They'd all worked for people like Larry Summers or Steve Ratner, people who um, came from a previous generation of Democratic policy wonks for whom um, kind of picking fights with Robert Reich or Jesse Jackson was a sign of their integrity and their intellectual honesty and their inability, their inability to, their ability to resist the soft-headed response. And there's almost a sociological element to this where people like Jake or Brian Deese could see the way in which the party was changing. And of course, you want to be right with the times. But then there was also the fact for Jake in particular, and I think for others, when Donald Trump's elected in 2016, people want to understand what all this rage was out there. Why did people hate elites? Why did they? Why was uh, Trump able to make so much hay out of bashing bankers in the way that he did? And so he started to go into kind of this brooding self-examination, and he conducted a series of focus groups in through the Carnegie Endowment in Ohio, in Nebraska. Uh, where he wanted to understand, especially about foreign policy, why 
people didn't think highly of American foreign policy. And he realized that part of the problem was people like him. And the fact that he hadn't paid attention to, he's from Minnesota, the ways in which trade deals might have hurt people back in Minnesota. Um, I guess my answer to your, your question is that um, Biden has gone in a different direction from Clinton and Obama, that if those administrations were more deferential to markets, more lukewarm to unions, um, kind of indifferent to the problem of monopoly, I think Biden represents a reversion to something closer to what New Deal liberalism looked like. Um, for Biden, his ideal is essentially uh, DuPont in the 1950s. He grew up in Wilmington. He kind of reveres the idea that maybe you could have a big corporation that implied, uh, employed a lot of people that actually made stuff and uh, that felt like it was rooted in a place and had some commitments to that place. And I think Joe Biden is somebody who's very nostalgic. He, for somebody who suffered so much in his past, he's always yearning for this Eden in the past, this, this home that exists there. And there was this way in which his nostalgia meshed with the changing intellectual currents within um, the younger part of the Democratic establishment. And they all rolled their eyes at him too, but then they saw that he was probably the best vehicle that they had for achieving um, their desire to transcend uh, the Clinton-Obama era of economics. That's a great lead into our third topic, which is looking ahead a little bit. I, I loved your answer about Biden's biggest strengths basically being his humanity. It, it seems to me consistent with that is that he understands where the American public is politically in ways that a lot of other politicians do not, right? He, he understands that the American public is actually quite progressive on economics, skeptical of trade. But he also understands the Democratic Party has gotten out to the left of the public on a whole bunch of social issues. People believe in border security, right? Um, they uh, are legitimately worried about crime, right? They don't dismiss it as, as something. And, and Biden, in many ways, it seems to me, this is how he won, right? He appealed to a working class constituency, largely black working class constituency in South Carolina. It vaults him to the nomination. He sort of sees not just the Democratic party, but the country more as it is than as uh, a, an academic faculty lounge might, <laughs> might want it to be. And so he has these huge strengths, and I think there's a real question about whether any other candidate in 2020 could have won, any of the other Democrats, and who might succeed him. Those are very large strengths. He beat Donald Trump, and yet <laughs> um, he's really old. Um, yeah, I don't see any decline in his mental acuity. I assume you have not in reporting the book, but he certainly looks old. He's physically slow. Um, uh, how weak do you think he is right now as an incumbent running for re-election? All right, well, I've spent having, my book came out in the middle of this whirlwind of polling and I think pundit wish casting to kind of push Biden out of the race. And so I've thought a lot about the age issue in a much more intense way than I did when I was thinking about the book itself, because my book is a chronicle. And as I was chronicling Biden's first two years, yeah, he, he like maybe woke up a little bit later in the morning. Yes, I could definitely see the ways in which his sentences trailed off a little bit more now than they did before. Um, like parentheses, I think some of that is him self-editing much more aggressively because he's very aware of his ability to gaff and as president of the United States, you can't gaff in the same sort of way that you do as a senator. Um, uh, but but you know, politically, and his political strategy in 2022 was to basically recede and let the issue be a referendum on Republicans. Yep. So my book comes out, people are asking all these questions. The polling is terrible for him on the age question. I mean, it's not just Republicans, it's Democrats. Um, and so here's how I've kind of tried to systematically think through it. So yes, on the question of mental acuity, it, you know, it, I think his age, you could argue from a governing perspective, is as much an advantage, probably more an advantage than it is a disadvantage at the present moment. 
that you look at something like Ukraine or any other number of examples, I think the stuff that he brings to the table, having been around the block, is real. Then there's the question about his, his ability to conduct a campaign, which is, I think, what a lot of this anxiety is about. And to me, that's a very big open question. I mean, he has to, the, the burden that he carries now is that he has to display energy uh, to, to the people. He has to somehow refute this thing that they all believe about him. I mean, it's not necessarily the threshold question because it's still, as he says, not about comparing him to the almighty, it's about comparing him to the alternative. And so that's, that's still, that's still, I mean, that's, I think, the thing that he has going for him in this campaign. Then there's the more theoretical question about would I prefer not to have an 85-year-old president? Right. And I think most people would answer the question, well, yeah, right. Like that's, but, but again, um, elections are choices. And the way that I think he thinks about it is that he's beaten Trump once before. Uh, people basically know who he is so that when they come at him, it's amazing how Republicans up until very this late hour kind of have struggled to define him politically, that they don't know there's not a single line of attack that they latched on to. And so it, it took them a while to make the Hunter Biden stuff kind of stick enough or the Sleepy Joe line that Fox is always peddling, which, by the way, is a conspiracy theory. I mean, it's about how some there's like a cabal pulling the strings yeah. behind Joe Biden, which there's no evidence for at all. In fact, I think the opposite is true, that Joe Biden has staff who is like who've been around him so long, who know his emotional, uh, his emotional makeup so well that they're probably reluctant to challenge him. And Joe Biden throws himself into micromanaging issues for better and for worse sometimes. The other thing that I think needs to be said is that Joe Biden's mental acuity questions don't exist on the same continuum as Donald Trump's mental acuity <laughs> issues. <laughs> Getting lost in a story about Jesse Helms' funeral is not the same as being a lunatic. <laughs> um, uh, Biden seems completely committed to running again. Uh, so it seems to me the only thing that would change that, f setting aside some hugely unexpected thing, is is some Democrat enters the race and does better than people expect, right? A, a Ted Kennedy, 1980, Pat yeah. Buchanan, yeah. 1992 scenario. Uh, what's, what's the latest a Democrat could do that realistically? I mean, we're getting we're getting pretty close yeah. to that moment. I, you know what I? So, I got asked a question on a TV show a couple of weeks ago about this, and um, the host said, "Would you be surprised if uh, if he didn't run?" And I said, I, "I'd be surprised, but not totally shocked." And I was like, "Oh, that's that's just me kind of giving a mealy mouth answer. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, not, not totally shocked. I'm not totally shocked about a lot of stuff in the world." And it got a lot of attention, and I started to think it through in a more systematic sort of way, um, as opposed to something that you just say on television. And um, I thought, okay, well, what's the scenario? The scenario is like you have a couple of polls that are not just an even matchup, but where he's losing by three or four percentage points, and then you start to have a real collective freakout within the Democratic Party. So far, the Democrats, at least in the in Washington and um, uh, elite circles, don't seem prepared to freak out about Joe Biden's age because they like him and because he's done a lot to deliver on the Democratic agenda and they rightfully fear what might happen in a Democratic primary. I mean, we just go back to 2016, the scars that were left by the Sanders-Clinton uh, primary didn't go away. They didn't heal, and they arguably helped to cost Hillary the, the election in the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're now going to open it up to questions from you all. This is when I um, have to be a little bit... You, there are microphones up here. Is, this the, is there just one? Just one. Come on up here. This is where I have to be a little bit of bad cop and say, um, uh, please make your question a question. Uh, and please make it one question. And if you have two and we get through everyone's yeah. one, then I'm happy to... Here's uh, seconds. Po as well. po political discussions in bookstores always go so well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but please. Uh, Biden once uh, famously said that I don't need you to vote for me. I only need you to follow what I say. Why did he say that? And do you think that maybe he's not only the last politician, but his might have been the last election? 
Well, you know, when I use the word last politician, the title last politician is one that was intended as a provocation. But on my mind was certainly the question <laughs> that you posed, because I just I, I've written about Biden's first two years, and I think I describe them as fairly successful two years. But Biden's legacy depends 125 percent on his reelection in 2024. And if he loses, um, you know, you, you can find my you might be able to find my book on remainder shelves in the back of uh, politics and prose. Uh, but it wouldn't be a very important, you know, or worthwhile read because it would be essentially a footnote to this other greater event in history. I wonder whether you have any thoughts about uh, the contribution of cable, even democratic cable news on all of the discussion, all the controversy over Biden's age and all of his problems. Um, just a point, I think, maybe more broadly about media in general that I've noticed, which is that um, after the Trump, the Trump era was very destabilizing for all parties involved including for media. And I think that me Trump took media out of its comfort zone in the way that they described the horrible things that he was doing. And the tenor of coverage was often more emotional. Um, I think media has been struggling with what it means to be objective, probably ever since media was created, but um, in, in the term of objectivity was first coined. But I think that that became an even more intense discussion during the Trump era. and. There's a desire, largely subconscious, I think, to restore objectivity, to restore journalistic authority. And as I think Biden has sometimes suffers as a result of that. Um, I think the other thing is, is that Biden is just bad ratings. Um, and so on cable news, everybody has gone down in their ratings. We've we've but one of Biden's goals was to return to some sort of boring. You know, the nation needed, the na politics had occupied too large uh, um, uh, a share of the, the national mind. And he, want, he that's not healthy. He wanted that to recede in part so that people could take the vaccine initially. That was a big part of his reason for trying to cool the nation's temperature, that he didn't, he wanted to persuade people to take the jab and the more that the jab was caught up in the culture war, the worse it was for everything about the country. But I think that um, Biden's boringness, which is a very subjective um, ratings driven <laughs> assessment is kind of the eye of the beholder. And uh, it's one of the reasons why the book surprised me was that Biden personally turned out to be more interesting than I thought he was. I think in terms of his agenda, it, there was, there's so much more there than I think the public connects with. And this is his fundamental problem, is that he did these things. He hasn't found a language for selling them to the public. Uh, the public gives him no credit for you know, the, uh, cutting carbon emissions by you know, however many percent and by preventing national decline by uh, uh, all these investments in semiconductors and infrastructures. Even the gun control bill that he passed is, is a massive mental health bill. You could go on down the list, and, um, and not to mention all the stuff that David was uh, uh, bringing us towards about unions and ma manufacturing, et cetera. People don't connect with it in any sort of way. And I think the fair question is how much of that is Biden's fault, and how much, you know, what, 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 what share of the blame does media carry in that? Uh, just very briefly, I do think chance that the swing voters in the 2024 election are going to be people by definition not spending a lot of time watching political cable TV and it may again be a strength for him. I'm not sure about that. but <laughs> That was a terrific talk. Thank you. Uh, and you've said things that other people haven't said, although my name is Bernie. Biden needed to listen to Bernie and they needed to come to a, and that's exactly what you just said. Can I, um, can I sure. talk about Go ahead. Well, I, ha I have a real question. Sorry. Go, go uh, for the, it. The, the real question is uh, Biden's relationship with Obama. Uh, how, did it, how did it work and how did it influence him? And talk about that. Okay. 
Uh, uh, two fascinating subjects embedded in your question. One is his relationship with Bernie Sanders, which right. I will I'll just talk about for 15 seconds. No, well, talk some more. Yeah, that's okay. Met it's a metaphorically, great scene. 15 seconds. It's a seconds. great scene. So one book. of the things that's interesting to me is that when Sanders would go to events at, in Iowa or wherever, he was often speaking before or after Joe Biden, uh -huh. and he would tell his staff, you know, he's the one other guy in this race who talks about non-college voters. And for Sanders, that's kind of the test of that's your right. political values. And so he's like, I don't, you know, we have different methods. Joe Biden's never gonna bash bankers in the way that I bash bankers, but I have an opportunity here. And so his staff was pushing him to, Bernie's staff was embrace, pushing him to embrace a much more confrontational relationship with Biden. And he saw this as kind of the opportunity of his lifetime to work symbiotically with the president. So um, you see this, and other classic examples of politicians. I'm thinking primarily about LBJ and MLK, not that there's comparisons directly to those figures, but Johnson was a politician who needed to be pushed by somebody from the outside who was talking to him both behind closed doors and creating political space for him externally. And right. I think that's how they both thought of that relationship. Obama and Biden have um, an amazingly complicated relationship um, where all of Joe Biden's insecurities were kind of brought to bear because if you take somebody who's already insecure and then you make them vice president of the United, <laughs> you're, you're like you're, you're like playing a mind game with them to try to destabilize them. And so, uh, but so initially there was a lot of tension in that relationship um, because for one thing, uh, Obama would refer to him as my vice president which struck Joe Biden like he was his, uh, you know, his dog or something. And so <laughs> um, he really resented that. And then um, there was this element where even though Biden, Obama is like the most outsider person to ever become a, a American president, uh, for Biden, he was kind of the insider guy. He was smooth in the way that Biden wasn't. He was a member of the Ivy League meritocrats in a way that Biden wasn't. And um, he knew that Obama would roll his eyes at him when, when uh, Biden would tell his stories and monologues, on, and right. that, which was like all this class uh, stuff was superimposed on. But over time, they developed this relationship because Obama actually needed Biden's help with foreign policy. And he, Congress. And with Congress. And there was a, uh, the journalist Jonathan Alter got uh, Biden to admit this one thing once, which was that in meetings, Obama had a way of tilting back his chair that was a signal to Biden that he was supposed to ask the uncomfortable question that Obama couldn't ask. And so they were in sync by the end. The other thing, I, I don't want to uh, go on for too long. I, I guess I do want to go on for too long. Um, uh, but I, was, I, had, I had a conversation with John Favreau, who is Obama's speechwriter, and um, he told me that at the beginning of the administration, there were these rote lines and speeches about how Washington was terrible, politics as usual was terrible, and that by the time they got to the end of the administration, Obama would look at drafts and he would cut those lines out. He said, I know why you guys have these in here. Uh, that was our campaign theme, but my view has changed over time. And he would talk about how he had much more respect for Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, and especially Joe Biden, because their understanding of politics actually turned out to be the correct understanding of politics. That's a nice story. Thank, Thank you. you. Leaving aside uh, Biden uh, and White House staff and members of Congress for a moment, were you impressed with any cabinet secretaries? Um, I, yes. Uh, so, uh, Gina Raimondo impresses me. Um, uh, I have a story in my book about how uh, there was a moment when negotiations with Manchin were completely broken. And Raimondo um, kind of volunteers to step in because she, Manchin likes Raimondo because she's more centrist. And he felt like they could talk to one another. And so Raimondo got invited to Joe Manchin's houseboat to watch the Super Bowl. And she was like, I got to take advantage of this moment. And so she pleads with him. She's like, look, I know you're pissed off at the White House right now about this bill. 
but we need to keep talking. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to invite you over to my house with Ron Klain, who's the White House Chief of Staff. You guys can't stand one another, but I'm going to force you to have a meal together. And Manchin wasn't sure what to do, and she kept pestering him, and he agreed. And he came to their house, and she sat them down, and she said, look, this is the moment we're going to get over all of this silliness, more or less. And so she, she spent the whole day cooking because she knew, like a, good, like a good politician, she knew the way to Joe Manchin's heart was like with her eggplant parm and her pork roast and her cannoli. And um, her, she sent her 15-year-old son out to get Joe Manchin his favorite bottle of scotch. And it's like all this stuff, which is so stupid on some level. Like the human parts sure. of politics sure. actually matter. And at the end of that meal, Ron Klain swallowed his pride and said, I'm sorry for whatever m misunderstandings we had. It's my fault. He took the blame. And he basically put, they cornered Manchin and made Manchin have to kind of accept, accept those apologies and agree to keep moving on. And that was a necessary uh, precursor for getting the Inflation Reduction Act passed in the end, which is the most significant reduction in carbon emissions <laughs> in global history, right? So it's, it's an incredible thing. I assume if he wins re-election, Raimondo's um, uh, highly, uh, is a potential Treasury Secretary. Is that the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, um, I want to turn the page a little bit and ask you about Kamala Harris. Yeah. It strikes me that given Biden's age and the fact that she is next in line is probably not one of the strongest features of the campaign. And uh, do you think there's any chance that uh, it could change who the vice president might be? Um, I would be even more surprised if Biden switched vice presidents than him not running. Would you be shocked? <laughs> I would be shocked. Yeah, because 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 um, like in in Biden's moral code, that sort of loyalty, and it's also wrapped up in the way that he was perceived. He perceived his own treatment as vice president. I just, it would really surprise me. And he he also doesn't fire people, uh, if for better and for worse. That after Afghanistan. He didn't fire a single person, and he absorbed all the blame for that himself. I mean, I think it's 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 actually one of his more honorable uh, traits. Although you know, not, you know, if people need to get fired, they should be fired. But I think um, his his relationship to I f I feel for Kamala Harris on one level, which is that the vice presidency is the premise for a comic show on HBO. <laughs> it's like every vice president we can remember, whether it's you know, well. I don't want. I don't want to. I won't make Dan Quayle the first point of comparison. But uh, Al Gore, or even Mike Pence, or you know George H. W. Bush down the line, there's similar sorts of stories that percolate about them when they're vice president. And Barack Obama needed Joe Biden. Joe Biden, in his own head, does not need Kamala Harris. He believes himself to be the supreme expert on every single piece of <laughs> policy, and so. Um, it's easy for her to feel uh, superfluous, although I think she is treated with incredible respect by him. And, um, and you know, you ask people about her performance in meetings, not just the political types who have an obligation to say um, she's really smart, but you go and you talk to uh, generals in the Pentagon, or you talk to foreign service people, or you talk to people involved with the public health response to the pandemic, They'll all describe her contributions in meetings as being very high quality, that she comes, she comes into every meeting extremely well prepared. Mm -hmm. Because she's a former prosecutor, she asks piercing questions. And so you know, none of that necessarily makes her a good candidate, right? And, and part of what her problem is is that she's stuck in her own head, that she's so afraid of making a mistake it, when, it, and, and just listen to her talk after I, I've explained this, because it's, it's so obvious when you start to listen to her. She's, her answers are being edited nonstop in her head, that she's not expressing her thought with any of the clarity that reflects any of the underlying skills that I just described, which is part of why politically um, like she just seems so flat. Authenticity is so important in politics, right? In different ways, Biden and Obama both have it. Uh, I know you said that uh, Biden is not managed inside, 
but Maureen Dowd today had an article about how you should be let free publicly. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was accurate, and two, what do you think would happen if that were the case? Yeah. Um, well, it would be pretty entertaining. <laughs> um, I actually agree with Maureen Dowd, especially at this moment where... So uh, when I did the book, uh, Joe Biden's got a very strange attitude towards political books. Um, he views potential books about his presidency as competitors for his own memoir, I'm told, <laughs> on some of them, which is like a very strange thought. Um, but um, it's also how old will he be when his <laughs> memoir comes out? <laughs> um, uh, and will anybody want to read the memoir of a first-term president? It's like, you know, you want her president? He has to. But so I think that there are a couple things that happen with his public persona. The first is you need to understand that the defining event in his political life was the plagiarism scandal that happened, which Maureen Dowd played some role in exposing in, in the 1980s when he, yeah. uh, 1987, when he was, um, said to have plagiarized a speech from the labor leader, Neil Kinnock. And that uh, caused him to change his persona, that he went from being in the parlance of the Senate, uh, these such cheesy terms, but he went from being a show horse to being a workhorse, <laughs> that um, he was determined never to you know, look like somebody who was um, speaking lines that were being fed to him by somebody else. So when he prepares for a press conference, or a, a speech or any sort of public, oh. he has this desire to master everything. And that's admirable, obviously on one level, certainly better than the way that other people prepare. Um, but on the other hand, it can be immensely time consuming and really tedious. So he's talking about childhood poverty and suddenly he wants the wonk who's the expert to come in. And then he's got a question about some story that he's like thinks he might be able to use from that wonk and then they have to bring in another expert in in order to verify that and suddenly his day is ripped to pieces so that's one thing why i think that they haven't sent him out there more and then the other is he knows who he is right he knows that and they know who he is and if he speaks in public he will he will say things that maybe reflect what he truly thinks <laughs> but shouldn't say, uh, the, what, they, what they used to call a Kinsley gaffe. Um, or the uh, Obama gaffe. Or, right, right, that's how we got gay marriage in this country. Um, um, or uh, he'll exaggerate, which he does when he talks about himself. Like his, his, his stories about himself just get better with time. <laughs> it's, yeah. Thank you. Those are great questions. Thank you all. Uh, oh, we have one more? Oh, yes, I was hiding behind. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading your book. You. I'm excited. And this, since this morning, I wanted to ask you if you could compare Cabo with Saigon, the fall of them. I know it's a tough one. Sorry. So the question is, what are the similarities between Cabo and, and Saigon? Saigon? Um, it's the same army. It's the same army. Um, I. I actually, so the fall of Saigon scarred the American military, changed American foreign policy for decades. Um, I, you know, there was um, the reluctance for, between, between the fall of Saigon and the intervention, I guess, between the Gulf War, there were, there were only limited American interventions. You had Granada, you had, but there was, there was kind of, within the Democratic Party especially, there was a reluctance to support um, uh, humanitarian interventions, and it took took the Bosnian War for that to to change. I don't think that that will be there'll be any sort of consequence like that emanating from this. I also think that there's a way in which a lot of what was said in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Ghani government in those terrible scenes at Hamid Karzai International Airport that we overstated the consequences of the collapse of of Afghanistan. That everybody said. Nobody would be able to trust American leadership. Got it. And Thanks. I mean, we've already disproven that with Ukraine, right? Where, where the European allies rallied, they, they listened to, they, people have made commitments to Ukraine based on our commitments. So as terrible as those images were, and mm -hmm. as terrible as the consequences actually were, I don't think that they will 
I don't think they're going to scar American foreign policy forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so Good. Frank began this conversation with a with a pay on to this bookstore. Uh, I will end it that way. This is an incredible community institution.